Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. Today, the Kraken, which I'm absolutely going to mispronounce Kraken throughout this episode, because that's how I think it's pronounced, but I looked it up and it's Crack. And apparently. So uh, let's jump in. The, the show, if you're new here, Katie's written me a script. I'm going to read it. We're going to explore it together. It starts with a poem. Let's go. <laughs> Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the crack and sleepeth faintest sunlights flee. About his shadowy sides, above him swell, huge sponges of millennial growth and height, and far away into the sickly light. From many a wondrous grot and secret cell, a numbered and enormous polypy, winnow with giant arms, the slumbering green. There hath he lain for ages, and will lie, battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep, until the latter far shall heat the deep, then once by man and danger. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Uh, I drank a whole can of coke before sitting down. Ah! Then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise and on the surface die. This is, I don't understand poetry. I'm just like, what? Did, has anyone seen that movie, Patterson? Like, I mean, it's like the worst movie I've ever seen. And the poetry's so bad. And apparently it's written by like some big poet dude who people love. And I'm like, bro, it doesn't even rhyme. Like, and I know it's not about that, but it was it was truly bad. And the guy was a truly bad poet. And I know you're supposed to root for him, but I'm just like, dude, this sucks, bro. No wonder you're still a bus driver and no one likes your poetry. It's what you deserve. So I was maybe a bit bit harsh, but I hated that movie. I hope you did that poem justice, Simon. <laughs> I don't think I did with that loud burp in minutes. But if you didn't, I'll take the blame. Chucking you into an extra cold read like that. It's Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Kraken. By the way, it was published in 1830, so don't worry, it's in the public domain. I think you can read a poem. Just a short... Oh, wait, it's a whole poem, isn't it? That could be an issue. But it's in the public. It's really old. It's really old. I think that would be fair use anyway. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think YouTube's going to claim that. In case you hadn't read <laughs> Tennyson's very f dead. In case you hadn't realized yet, today we're going to get entangled in the many tentacles belonging to this sea monster, culminating with a question posed by a paleontology student which asks, did late Triassic, tri Triassic colloids actually have by cereal suckers. Oh my god, what was that sentence? Yes, viewers, we're going for a deep dive on this one in all senses of the world, so make sure those oxygen tanks are full and your mask is clear because it's time to roll backwards off this boat. Scuba diving. Lots of scuba diving references there. Well, I, my one, I'm not generally afraid of stuff, but the one thing that makes me like irrationally fearful is deep water. So I've never really been like keen to go scuba diving and stuff because you like even on a boat if I look over the edge all I can think about is that and I know it's ridiculous is that I'm on a boat and below me is just like unknown depths and things and things that could just there's no wall it's just like whatever's down there could just swim towards me and get me and it's also just weird thinking that you're not standing on anything solid but you're so far above the ground I don't know why that really that really gets me I'm not a big fan of deep water, so no, scuba diving, not for me. Baby, I'm scared. Let's get cracking. Uh, <laughs> sea monsters have been around for as long as people have been able to travel on the sea. Whether you're on a long-haul fishing trip, expedition, or whatever, there comes a point when you're far enough out on the water that you can't see anything but the sea. No land, no other boats, nothing but the vast expanse of whatever ocean you're on, stretching as far as you can see in all directions. Have you guys played that game? I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's so addictive and it's so fun. Um, it's you, you, you survive a plane crash and you're in the sea. It's a recent game, or relatively recent, last few years. And you're in the sea, and then you're on a life raft, and you've got to paddle this life raft towards an island, and then you've got to like craft. So you're like making a camp, you're like making all this stuff, you eventually make like a boat, you have to go around all of these like shipwrecks and find stuff to like hopefully escape, and it's very compelling. And it's just the same thing, you're just like out on the ocean. And I'm like, I don't like how deep it is. And the sharks and stuff. Is there anything else that will give you such a horrible feeling of unease as that? I mean, yeah, there's loads of things that would make me feel more uneasy than, than that. Because, like, you're on a boat. If I was in the water, I'd be way more uneasy. <laughs> 
You can't see very far down. Anything could be under there. You don't know how deep it is or what or whether some awful toothy creature is speeding up like a bullet from the depths at the ver at that very second with its mouth open, ready to swallow your whole boat. No, no, I don't think that. If I was in the water, I think it's gonna swallow my whole body, but I don't think it's gonna swallow the whole boat. I mean if it, even if like a giant like off blue whale or something, that's not gonna that's not gonna eat a boat. Boats are big and not food. What was that over there? An eel? Or just the end of a tentacle of something a lot bigger? Is there a huge bulbous cephalopod lurking mere feet below, or in, waiting to whip out its tentacles and destroy your vessel? Or will it just cruise by underneath without you even realizing how near death you were? With water covering 70% of our planet and at least 80% of this never having been explored, it's little wonder that the seas and oceans hold so much fear and folklore going far back as humans do. Before we crack on with the main uh, character of this episode, we do need to do a little bit of due diligence and go back and look at stories that predate what we collectively call the Kraken. Actually, quick aside here, Simon, have you been saying Kraken or Kraken or maybe even Kraken? Yeah, Kraken is what I would want to do, but it's Kraken, right? I looked it up before this. I don't think in this episode it particularly matters. Personally, I prefer Kraken, as it's easier to make jokes with. But I've already used up the best Kraken pun for the title of this section, and it wasn't very original. Um, yeah, if I was pronouncing it Kraken, it would be it would be less effective. It's gla I'm glad that we're on the same page. Me, you, Katie, and Forvo, the pronunciation guide. It's Forvo.com. F-O-R-V-O.com. You're welcome. It's kind of clunky, and it looks like it was made about 20 years ago, but it's uh, it does what it says on the tin. It tells you how to pronounce words. <laughs> That's amazing. Anyway, back to the story. Way before this particular sea monster was given a name, we had, we had Scylla, Char Charybdis, popping up in Greek mythology and in Homer's Odyssey around the 8th century BC. Those were two sea monsters who lived on opposite sides of a channel, meaning that you'd have to choose to go nearer one than the other. Apparently the phrase between Scylla and Charybdis is synonymous with between a rock and a hard place, but probably only among the most dedicated classical scholarly types. I'm like, yep, that's something I've never said, but I'll often use between a rock and a hard place. I've seen Scylla described as basically having six dogs instead of legs and a normal head. <laughs> if someone replaced my legs with dogs, I'd be like, oh, for God's sake, what happened to my legs? Now I've just got these two dogs attached to me. Be rubbish. But also having 12 feet and six heads on necks like snakes. <laughs> Dude, people who made up like mythology in the past were smoking crack or whatever they smoked in the past. Because like, it's like, what do you have? I have dogs for legs and uh, head is a serpent. <laughs> like, what the f***? Chardibus is a little more straightforward, either causing or actually being a whirlpool that sucked boats down to their dooms. Other classical sea monsters of time past include Cetus, which was more whale-like, various Hydra, and the, and the biblical sea serpent Leviathan. You may have noticed that none of these monsters really sound much like what we know as the Kraken today, which is generally represented as some sort of huge octopus or squid thing. Didn't that- I thought Kraken came from that dude. The dude who looks really weird, and wasn't he a bit racist? I mean, even for like- I mean, it was the past, like, people were, like, racist, but, like, wasn't this guy, like, specially racist? The guy who wrote about the Kraken? He's dead, right? He's got- I hope he's dead. I mean, not like that. I mean, maybe- I don't know. Maybe how bad of a racist was he? I mean, like, he's not gonna- I, I'm not defaming him, because he's dead. <laughs> oh, God. Should we ask ChatGPT? Let's ask ChatGPT. ChatGPT doesn't connect. Don't let me down like this. It failed. Tap to retry. Let's close the app and try again. Don't do this to me, ChatGPT. I need you. Come on now. Oh, don't do this, ChatGPT. I need to know if the Kraken guys are racist. Ah, oh, don't do this, ChatGPT! Okay, I guess we'll never know, because I'm not going to use Google like a peasant. This might be because, even way back in the time of Aristotle in the 4th century BC, large squid were already recognized as being exist in existence, so the monsters didn't really resemble them as mythical monsters were usually mashups of different creatures or totally bizarre inventions such as dogs instead of legs, etc. Yeah, it's bizarre, dude. Crack smoking. This all changed over time, but we've jumped ahead a bit, so let's get back to our origin story of our sea monster. We probably get the name Kraken from Old Norse, as, as the thing first burst onto the sea in the Norwegian Sea, but definition-wise, I've seen things ranging from the arms, to malformed tree, to crawling, to anchor. Germans use the words crack to both refer to the Kraken specifically, and also just octopus in general, but to avoid confusion, they use the word octopus for the non-fictional creature. 
The Kraken was also supposedly called So Trolden or Sea Mischief, which makes it sound like a naughty little troublemaker rather than a monstrous beast that crushed ships and ate people. It seems like the Norse people had lots of other monsters going on in the colder parts of the globe. There was also the Hafgoofer, which translates to Sea Mist or Steam, which has appar- appeared in written accounts at least as early as the 13th century. This was a sea monster that hung around near Greenland and apparently self chummed to attract fish what does that mean self chummed basically this means it vomited out stuff into the sea as bait and then ate all the fish that came up came to turned up to eat it oh <laughs> then those fish are gonna go through a cycle aren't they it's like that venus flytrap that eats flies and then doesn't it use the rotting fly flesh to attack attract more flies how f-ed up are flies like if you're can you imagine as a person if you're just walking down the street like Wow, that smells good. I should go eat that. And then you go into the building and it's just a dead person, like, rotting away. And you're like, "Mm." (laughs) mmm. Why are flies like that? Yum. (laughs) There was also the Lingbacker, or Heatherback, which was a monster so large and covered in vegetation that it was mistaken for an island. When sailors pitched up alongside and went for a walkabout on it, it would submerge and drown them all. That sounds real. These two monsters might just be elements of yet another enormous beast, which was called Aspid... (laughs) Dochalone. <laughs> Definitely not pronouncing that right. I saw a video about this, and the presenter pronounced it like I spit a cologne. Okay, <laughs> but I can't vouch for how correct this is. Appearing in the second century. I like mine better. Aspitatalone. Ah, wow, it actually sounds quite similar to what this dude, I assumed, guessed. Appearing in the second century text, Physiologus. This giant whale or turtle pretends to be an island to lure unwitting sailors and it also attracts fish to it with a sweet smell. There are actually about a billion other sea monsters that we could talk about, but these seem to be the main ones in the formation of the Kraken legend. The Havgoofer and Lingbecker fell out of fashion over the years. People started conflating them, and eventually there could only be one monster to rule the sea, and it became known as the Kraken. God damn it, Kraken. By the mid-1700s, the Kraken had become an enormous tentacled thing that could destroy ships by wrapping its arms around them, but could also pull them under the water via a whirlpool when it submerged like our old friends Char- Charybdis. <laughs> How- <laughs> These pronunciations, I know I'm just getting them horribly wrong, but I also don't care. How did it end up as a giant cephalopod when earlier monsters didn't really have these characteristics? Well, it's probably because as time went on and people sailed around more, they saw things that actually bore a resemblance to this creature, and thus the legends grew. Goodbye, whale with an island on its back. Hello, much larger version of a squid or octopus. It's also because starting in the 1700s, the Kraken started making its name via scientific journals and also from alleged actual encounters. This is one of those decoding the unknowns where it's not, obviously it's not like an actual Kraken or whatever. But there are giant squids, right? <laughs> squids, right? What are you talking about, Simon? There are giant squids, right? Because I feel like they found one and then they had its like that weird beak thing that they have. And then they also found like some big shits from a whale or whatever. And it had even bigger beaks from these squids inside. And so scientists were like, yeah, it's f- massive squids down there which is kind of scary. Swedish biologist Carl Linnaeus, also known as the father of taxonomy or the slightly less catchy godfather of binomial nomenclature for creating biological classifications for all known organisms, you know the names like Gorilla Gorilla and Rattus Rattus, he started Systema Turturii in 1735 and guess what made an appearance in the first edition? The Kraken, classified as Sepia Microcosmos, which comes in the cephalopod class under the genus of the cuttlefish. <laughs> cuttlefish are like the least intimidated. It's like a little cuttlefish. I don't actually know what a cuttlefish looks like. I think I've only ever seen cuttlefish shells on the beach, but they're small, and I don't imagine they belong to a particularly intimidating creature. Up to this point, I hadn't thought of cuttlefish at all, as they're quite small, although darn if they don't look like your archetypal kraken, a kind of mixture of a squid and an octopus. Wait, am I thinking of the same thing? Like cuttlefish? I'm just going to look this up real quick. Cuttlefish. Cuttlefish. Oh, Jesus. Is that what they look like? I imagine them more like a fish. Cuttlefish bone. Ah, it's a bone. Yeah, that's what I that's what I know. Oh, wow, you can get 10 cuttlefish bones for parakeets for 2 pounds. Wow, that's kind of a deal. Maybe I'll get some cuttle bones. <laughs> what the f- is this? <laughs> what? What? The main thing that cuttlefish bones seem to be used for is feeding f- parakeets. <laughs> 
What is going on? Why do they want those specifically? Oh, wow. I've got one here for a euro fifty. Wow. Okay, enough about cuttlefish. The Kraken also appeared in 1746's Fauna Svetica, with Linnaeus describing it as a singular monster, albeit one he admitted to never having actually seen. Not long after, it seems that Linnaeus realized the error of his ways and left the sea monster out of further editions of his work, but this early rubber stamping of the creature earned it a real place in history and also cemented the now common aesthetic of the monster as a cephalopod. In the 1750s, historian Eric Ponte. Pidin wrote his Attempts at Norway's Natural History, which again featured the kraken as a real creature. He described it as round, flat, and full of arms, and the longest and most surprising of all the animal creation. Pontipedian gave various examples of what its classification could actually be, ranging from a type of octopus or starfish to a giant crab. Bro, when you said like attempts at Norway's natural history, you re really were just making an attempt, weren't you? Because you just make it up, bro. You're like, well, it could be an octopus or it could be a giant crab. I've never seen one. No one knows if it's actually real, but it could be any of these things. Yeah, yeah, it could also be a kettle, but it's probably not. He also, I don't know where kettle came from, why I chose kettle. I'm not even looking at a kettle. What a weird thing to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he also said it was so big it could be mistaken for a mountain when rising out of the sea, and that it had a circum circumference of 2.5 kilometers. Although I don't know if that was the body by itself or when it had all of its arms outstretched. Well, whatever it is, it's ridiculous, bro. You just make it shit up. It might also be worth pointing out here that Pontipedians seem to be really into sea lore, also featuring giant sea serpents and mermaids in his natural history so bless him <laughs> yeah bro you made an attempt didn't you? you had a crack at it some might say the 1800s brought many unsubstantiated tales of encounters with the beast and paintings woodcuts and engravings started solidifying the current recognizable form of the kraken there were stories of how to tell if a kraken was nearby if your boat is a couple of miles out on a hot day over a particularly deep part of the sea all the fish in the area would be pushed to the surface as the kraken started rising rumor has it that some fishermen actively tried to find the kraken as if they could get away in time the amount of fish they would catch would be worth the risk tennyson wrote the poem that we started with in 1830 and in 18 in 1833, William Jardine published The Naturalist's Library, featuring a chapter on the Kraken, which includes this bit. The belief in this monster is, however, universal among the sailors and fishermen of the Norwegian coast, and it has been alluded to by all the Scandinavian writers from the earliest period down to the present day. He quotes tales of the Kraken from Pontipedian's writings before, saying, Probably without much difficulty, this extraordinary Kraken may be identified with certain species of sepia or cuttlefish, which have been described in the annals of science. Bro, this is like you going on the internet and just finding a fact that someone has written on a website and then writing it down as well and being like, fact substantiated. And the problem is then you get like two places that are saying this fact is true, even though they're just all copying each other and it often gets it wrong. Get it wrong. It's, uh, yeah, this was like the <laughs> misinformation before there was the internet. Amazing. Jardine then quotes someone who had seen a massive cuttlefish, but I don't think they get that large. So maybe this person had actually seen a giant squid. He goes on to list several examples of ships and humans being attacked by massive arms or tentacular, and also sightings of the Kraken by different people all over the world. This chapter ends by saying, long quote here, The great Norwegian animal thus named is to be considered not as a wild and groundless chimera, but as either identical with or nearly allied to the colossal cuttlefish. It must be confessed that many of the accounts to which we have referred, if, if considered singly, are much too vague and identifiable to form the foundation of any opinion but it is the general import and tendency of the whole combines which should be considered in this view. It would be contrary to an enlightened philosophy to reject as spurious the history of an animal, the existence of which is rendered so probable by evidence deduced from the prevailing belief of different tribes of mankind, whose opinions it is evident. Oh my God, get to the point. Writers in the past, you're getting paid by the f***ing word. Good Lord, be more wordy. It is evident it could not have been influenced or affected by the tradition of each other, but must have resulted in the occasional appearance of the monster itself in different quarters of the globe. Okay, so basically, in that enormously wordy thing, what he's trying to say in like two, one sentence is, I think the Kraken's real because loads of people have seen it, even though it's not really confirmed. Boom! Done. Why couldn't you write that? 
As well as saying the Kraken might actually exist, albeit as a natural creature, Pontopedian and Jardine put into print many alleged examples of the creature attacking ships, grabbing and killing sailors, and creating whirlpools to drag its hapless victims to their deaths. In 1851, Herb and Melville name-checks it in Moby Dick, although it's a skeptical reference, saying, quote, There seems some ground to imagine that the great Kraken of Bishop Pontopedian, Ponte Ponte whatever his name is, may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it as alternately rising and sinking with some other particulars he narrates in all this the two corresponds but much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it hmm what a logical approach we have there i mean yes also it's like so hard to read like okay okay i don't know so he's like i don't even know what he's saying reading things from the past is so hard like it's so hard what are you saying i've tried reading books like I tried reading the Count of Monte Cristo, which is apparently amazing. And I'm just reading it and I'm like, oh yeah, but the old language, it's like, it's so, it's like hard work. And all I do all day is read. And then it's just like to read something hard as like for fiction in the evening is really hard. You're just like, oh, I don't want to read this. I just want to read something easy. In 1861, a small French warship called Alecton had uh, one of the first recorded encounters with a real life giant squid. While there had been anecdotal stories about them before, the general scientific consensus of this period was that they didn't actually exist. This is slightly confusing as the Kraken had been listed as an existing creature a hundred years before, but a large squid was not thought of as being such a viable creature. Well, apparently not. The crew tried to capture the squid, but it was too heavy to be pulled aboard and all they were left with was the end of what they called the tail which i assume to be the top thin part not the end of an arm this part by itself allegedly weighed about 14 kilograms or 30 pounds which is about twice the weight of a bowling ball or one third the weight of a toilet apparently it was sent off a study but it seems to have gotten lost in almost immediately this thrust the idea of the kraken back into the public consciousness especially in the world of literature so we are now awash with Krakens popping up in pieces by Victor Hugo, Jules Verne, and John Wyndham. Cthulhu. Cthulhu? Cthulhu? Cthulhu, right? H.P. Lovecraft. That's the guy I was wondering if he's a racist. Yo, ChatGPT, you back? No, ChatGPT's not back. ChatGPT, don't do this to me. Don't leave me. I know you're very busy because everyone loves you, but we need to talk. ChatGPT! Never mind. F*** you. I just wanted to talk. We're supposed to be friends. Nowadays, the monster's tentacles are spread all over the entertainment sphere with appearances in Clash of the Titans, where it has erroneously been inserted into Greek mythology, a couple of Pirates of the Caribbean films, and a 2023 animated film called Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken, which sounds like it should rhyme, but it doesn't. Um, yeah, I, I don't like these movies. Like, Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm just like, no. I think I saw the first one, and I was already no, and then they made like 900 more, and I'm like, I'm just pretty out on all of that. Clash of the Titans. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds like it's going to be some like weird semi fantasy history thing, which I'm going to hate. House Greyjoy from Game of Thrones. Another TV show that I've never. I've, I've tried to get into Game of Thrones. I can't do it. I've watched the first episode twice, and I'm just like, no. And people are always like, you have to get into it for a few episodes. And I'm like, yeah, 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 but I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> it's just too much work. There's so much good TV already. Uh, has a Kraken as their sig. Gill, and it made a brief appearance on the TV show Our Flag Means Death, which also features the world's hottest blackbeard. It had been a fixture in, fixture in video games and tabletop gaming for decades, and in 2021, an ice hockey team was founded called the Seattle Kraken. So, right, I think we're up to date with the history of this thing, so now it's time to talk cephalopods. Octopi Wall Street. Ah. <laughs> Whatever people thought the Kraken was or wasn't, it's now commonly perceived to be a giant cephalopod of some sort. The common characteristics of cephalopods are that they are marine animals with definite heads and tentacles or arms and the ability to squirt ink. Obviously, octopi, squid, and cuttlefish are classed as cephalopods, and so is the Nautilus. But we can count that one out as it has a shell, and no mention of the Kraken has said it was actually in a huge shell the entire time. We're going to talk about the differences between octopuses and squid for a moment, even though I think that discussion is moot as the Kraken is a legend and not actually a real creature, so it doesn't matter whether it's more like an octopus or a squid as it doesn't exist, well said. Anyway, early illustrations of the Kraken in its familiar cephalopod form definitely skew octopus for me. Many of the pictures show tentacles or arms coming out of the sea and wrapping around a boat with the monster's two large eyes and a bit of its head slash body showing. This gives the impression that the head is more rounded like the octopus and not elongated with a triangular end like the squid. Also, the arms all seem more or less of the same length and covered in suckers. As well as having eight arms, squid also have two longer tentacles with suckers just on the ends, not all the way along. Actually, some 
farm squid have really creepy looking barbs and hooks on the ends of their tentacles that can swivel about to keep hold of their prey obviously nowadays anything goes with the kraken being depicted however you want as long as there are tentacles involved somewhere by the way i have been throwing out arms and tentacles somewhat interchangeably although i know there technically is a difference with arms having the suction cups all over them and tentacles only having them at the ends well what do you know <laughs> there you found something out today didn't you thus an octopus has no tentacles but does have eight arms but you know what when we're talking specifically about the kraken i think we can use whichever one we feel like and if you don't agree please refer to the previous point about it not being real the early drawings of the kraken may look more like octopuses because everyone knew octopuses existed they don't live as deep down as larger squid and even now they're viewed as extremely weird creatures so it'd be easy to model a many-armed monster on one of these when the existence of things like giant squid became known later in the 19th century however it seemed more likely that the kraken myth was based on these guys as they can grow much larger than the largest octopus i will ask you a question here are some squid facts we know there are little squid and giant squid the largest giant squid are mysterious animals that live hundreds of meters down in oceans across the globe where humans just can't go because they live way down deep they're the products of the amazingly named abyssal gigantism where invertebrates can grow massive compared to their relatives living in shallower waters which kind of seems counterintuitive right because you're like isn't there loads of pressure down there so you'd be like wouldn't that make them like small but apparently not I'm sure there's a good reason. While some had washed up or come to the surface in the past, a few strandings occurred in New Zealand and around Newfoundland in the 1870s and 1880s, bringing the possible monster firmly into the realm of reality. The giant squid was also finally officially classified as Architethus ducks in 1857 by Norwegian naturalist Japeta Steenstrup. It wasn't until 2004 that we had any photos of a living giant squid in its deep natural habitat, so it's no wonder that scientists in the past undenied over whether it was real or not. And if a giant squid was real, why not something even larger? Well, if you weren't already aware, there is something even larger than the giant squid in the cold depths of the ocean, and that is, drumroll please, the colossal squid. Oh, I didn't know. I kind of thought giant squid and colossal squid must be the same thing, but I realized colossal squid is probably the new one that you know wasn't discovered back in the 1800s well their bodies are much larger longer and heavier but their tentacles don't grow quite as long as the giant squid it is massive though with one found in new zealand weighing almost twice as much as a giant squid of 490 kilograms to the puny 275 kilograms that giant squid can grow to it also has a massive beak much larger than the giant squids and those things are sharp lengthwise though there's not much competition or at least not yet as with most things that go on in the murky depths of the world world's oceans we just don't know that much about the colossal squid here's what john abbott the senior curator in charge of mollusks at the natural history museum had to say about this although we don't know everything that's in the deep most scientists now believe that female giant squid reach around 13 meters long and males around 10 meters in case of the colossal squid the jury is out the biggest one found today was around nine meters long but it wasn't fully mature some scientists believe they don't get as big as giant squid and never reach 13 meters while others think they could grow even bigger to 18 meters an 18 meter or 60 foot long squid is no joke that's 12 danny devitos laid end to end in the water beside you it's terrifying isn't it in case you've been wondering how big octopuses get you're going to be disappointed the largest species of octopus is the giant pacific octopus and while the average length from top to tip is quite impressive at about five meters this is less than half the length that a giant squid can get up to we can be fairly sure that sightings of a giant squid or possibly even a colossal one are what gave the kraken rumors legs or rather arms ah. but what if its aggressive behavior could a squid really attack a boat as is fairly unlikely as the giant squid is built to be a deep sea dweller and only comes to the surface if it's dead or dying it's possible that one was still alive to fling a tentacle or arm over a small boat at some point but this would have not been an attempt to crush the boat or as a precursor to picking up individual crew members it would have just been something to hold on to the muscles in the squid's tentacles aren't strong enough to wrap around and constrict or crush anything they mostly just dangle down in the depths waiting for prey to come along we've heard of epic battles between giant squid and sperm whales but the squid aren't the aggressors here they're not engaging in arm-to-mouth combat with the whales to see who will win they're just trying to get away i think we're all pretty much convinced that any tales of the kraken at least from the past couple of hundred years have just been tall tales spun from an encounter with a squid that was much larger than anyone would have been expecting but what if there actually was something even more enormous in the past we know that there were huge examples of modern day animals like the giant ground sloth and giant beaver way back in the ice age and the megalodon was about three times the size of current great whites so could there have been another deep sea titan ruling the waves release the triassic kraken kraken
God damn it! Since 2011, paleontologist Mark McMenahim. M McMenah. Mark McMenahim. Okay, okay. Dude, could you have more M's in your name if you tried? There's four M's in your name. One, two, three. And it's not even long. So 4M has been putting forth a theory about a huge cephalopod that was killing ichthyosaurs about 250 million years ago. Considering the size of the prey and the remains of a fossilized beak he found in 2013, the ancient sea monster would have reached about 30 meters, 100 feet, or twice the length of your largest giant squid these days. And what evidence has he found? Well, apparently there are fossilized remains of ichthyosaurs, such as the very large Shonosaurus popularis, where the vertebrae have been moved around and placed into neat patterned rows, resembling a double row of suction cups that you'd find on the underside of an octopus's arm. That is creepy. Why is it just sucking on the vertebrae? This also mimics known behavior of squid and especially octopuses that are highly intelligent and can manipulate objects in this way. But why? What do you want with my spine? <laughs> Why is that what you want? This was only one example, but old 4M also saw a photo of a now-removed museum display that, that was set out exactly as the skeleton had originally been found. There was another row of removed vertebrae in the same formation laid to one side of the main skeleton. 4M said, We think one plausible explanation of this is an attack on the ichthyosaur by a much larger predator. He also believes that the formation of these vertebrae to look like a double row of suckers is intentional, a cephalopod's calling card, if you will, or even something of a self-portrait. I mean, okay, I get they're smart, but are they that smart? It seems a bit unrealistic. It seems more just they were like sucking on those bones and then they just laid them down the website greek gods and goddesses dot net <laughs> okay then also chimes in with quote these bones look like gigantic octopus gills since the ichthyosaur grew to be up to 66 feet long an octopus would have to be very large indeed to hunt and eat one scientists even found one ichthyosaur skeleton with a rib cage cracked from conscription it was as if a large tentacle had been wrapped around the ichthyosaur, crushing it and dragging it down. For this to be possible, a very large octopus must have really existed at one time. Add to this, the large beak 4M found in the same state park as the first skeleton, and some tentacles are starting to twitch in the direction of a monstrous octopus. Or maybe the tentacles are twitching but the creature is no longer alive, as this theory is not supported by anyone else, apparently, in the entire world. <laughs> so it did get peer reviewed, did it? A blog about this by Tyler Greenfield, who was a paleontology student at the time, clearly sets out how, thanks to what we know about marine life in the Triassic period and what we know about the evolution of cephalopods, that this monster thing is just impossible. This brings us back to his burning question at the top of the episode. Did late Triassic coloids actually have bicereal suckers? <laughs> what he's asking is if these types of cephalopods had double rows of suckers at this time in the past, and the answer is a resounding no. They only had unicereal suckers. So this puts paid to the idea that the ginormopus was leaving a picture of himself made out of vertebrae of other animals. Greenfield also points out that the only evidence we have of Triassic period coloids are all less than a meter long. So, are there any other explanations for how these neatly arranged vertebrae formations could have occurred? Well, yes, of course there are. How about just the currents buffeting the bones together as the rest of the skeleton decayed? How about just random chance as there have only been two examples of this found so far? David Fostovsky, paleontologist who sat through one of 4M's presentations, states, A kraken isn't really necessary. Everything can expl be explained by much less exotic means. Ah, yes. Old Fastovsky there, a fan of Occam's Razor. The simplest solution, usually the right one. And old 4M's like, nah, giant, 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 colossal, turbo, dinosaur squid. Kind of a killjoy, but he's not wrong. The fossilized beak wasn't much in the way of conclusive evidence either, as it wasn't complete and could really have been anything. Even if it was a part of the beak, there wasn't enough of it left to be able to extrapolate the size of a cephalopod out to 30 meters. Just squidding. Why this can't be real. While the sea is vast and unknowable, and even the largest vessels are nothing more than dots on its surface, with the combined knowledge we have of fossils, animal biology, and real-life specimens, or lack thereof, it's safe to conclude that there is no such thing as the Kraken in a 30-meter-plus form that consciously attacks boats for fun. Sailors who might have been feeling a little on edge being out in the middle of nowhere probably saw a large cephalopod which, which might have even attached itself to their boat, and their imaginations inflated the encounter when they got back to shore. 
This would mean more people on the lookout for the Kraken, and therefore more sightings, whether based on something real or not. Might there be even larger species of squid or octopus that we don't know about? Well, maybe, but it's unlikely they're going to be more than twice the size of what, them of what we've currently got. Why? Why? The ocean's real big. There could be all sorts of weird down there. I don't believe like there's an actual crack of like drowning boats and stuff, but I do believe there could be some like big ass sh down there that we don't know about. Did we say like 80% of it's unexplored? Who knows what's down there? The main mystery for me here is why the ancient Greeks and Romans recorded the giant squid as a real animal, and then it fell into the realm of legend for centuries before being recognized again in the 1850s. Pliny the Elder, a 1st century AD Roman naturalist and author, wrote a book about a squid measuring more than 9 meters with a body like a barrel. In his work Natural History and Aristotle had mentioned it even earlier in Historius Allo Animalium although not quite such a gigantic specimen. I suppose the giant squid's elusiveness doesn't help, and it was probably only when countries started exploring further across the oceans that the chances of seeing one increased. There also haven't been any modern-day kraken sightings. And we have to keep going back to the same boring point as we do for all cryptids and monsters. Are there just one or two that live for thousands or even millions of years, or are there enough of these things to maintain a breeding population? Neither seems very likely, so I think we can leave this beast in the story where it belongs. I mentioned to my daughter that I was doing an episode on the Kraken, and she said, The Kraken isn't real, it's just a giant squid, you don't have to do a whole decoding the unknown about it. Well, the joke's on you, because we just did. Yes, we did, and I hope you liked it. If you did, leave a review for this show wherever you get it, or a rating on Spotify. It's also available as a video podcast. Hello there, video watchers. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.